what I want to talk about is, in fact, the new uh, NAPRC. And for this, because it's an effort of societies and nothing to do with instruments, techniques, technology, it's it's clearly not anything. I picture Vice, but Sandy's not an APD. Huh? A picture Ah, okay. Thank you. She got it. Okay. Magic. Thank you. Um, no relevant financial disclosures. So just to kind of focus for med students and, and early year general surgery residents and the like, what, what we're going to be talking about is, is the rectum and rectal cancer. And a lot of the debate centers around how this part of the body is removed, when it's removed to, to treat rectal cancer. Uh, simple things like at what level do you ligate the artery? Do you ligate it above the left colic or, or distal to the left colic? Ditto for the vein, which I didn't picture in order to get all the lymphatics. Okay, so this is what we're focused upon. As you kind of drill down a little bit, you see the challenge of the rectum, unlike the colon, because the colon is, is suspended on a long mesentery, and although there is debate now about central venous ligation and complete mesocolic excision, basically it's easier to achieve holding it up, and whether laparoscopically, robotically, or uh, opened or hand assisted to hold it up and, and to take a swath of mesentery. The, the rectum is within the confines of the pelvis. So you have the pubis anteriorly, the sacrum posteriorly, laterally of the pelvic sidewalls, but the additional challenge is the anal sphincter muscles. So whether you need to go five or ten centimeters one direction or another on the colon won't really affect much, but in the rectum it affects a lot. It may be the difference between a permanent colostomy and a restorative resection because depending where the tumor is relative to the dentate line, the internal sphincter and the external sphincter, that becomes an additional challenge. So the limitations are not only the bony pelvic ones but also the anal sphincter as well. Further, the rectum doesn't have the same latitude as a margin. <clears throat> The colonic mesentery is quite long. The rectal mesentery is, is circumferential instead. It's rather a different shape. And it was named in about 1982 by uh, Bill Heald in Basingstoke, England, as the Holy Plain, trying to take out this entire fatty envelope where there might be, as, as shown in the artist's rendition, there might be some tumor deposits. And this, I, I commend this book to anybody doing any oncologic surgery. It's a two-volume series that we put out from the Commission on Cancer. Uh, on operative standards. Heidi Nelson was the, the series editor. She's now the director of all the cancer programs for the ACS. Um, and uh, uh, Kelly Hunt, I think, has taken over this task from, from MD Anderson. But the book is basically an atlas of uh, consensus and evidence-based guidelines for best practice for surgery, whether it's head and neck or, or rectal cancer, or colon cancer, and, and the like. Uh, it goes through everything. So in any event, we need to take out the tumor as shown here with any potential deposits within this envelope when we operate. Now, if we can't do that, we may need to do an abdominal perineal excision. And you know, there's two ways to do that. There's an intersphincteric resection, which is appropriate for inflammatory bowel disease when you want to limit wound healing problems, particularly in patients who are on biologics, although perhaps not after what I heard yesterday, um, or high doses of steroids. Um, it's rarely appropriate in cancer. It, there are always exceptions to every rule, and you may have a patient with an upper rectal cancer who has a baseline incontinence score of 20, and you decide to do an abdominal peritoneal excision rather than leaving a low Hartman's, and fair enough. But generally speaking, we're talking about taking out the entire fatty envelope around uh, the, the anal sphincters for an oncologic abdominal perineal excision. So if we can't do a restorative resection, we're doing an abdominal perineal resection. Now, there are a lot of variables that are surgeon dependent. <clears throat> One is the distal margin, and I kind of just alluded to that. Depends where the tumor is in relation to the sphincters, whether or not you're going to be able to preserve continence and, and sphincteric function. The TME, I'll touch on that a little more, and the circumferential resection margin, which has really supplanted the distal rectal margin as, as one of the keys. Reconstructive techniques, which are not in the scope of this talk, but whether you're just doing a straight anastomosis, making a colonic J-pouch, as, as Andrew mentioned, or whether you're going to do a coloplasty to make a wider colon or an end to side or side tent, how you put it together. That's, that's not really an oncologic influence so much as a functional one. This one's important, and this one really led to why the program exists now, the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. And what's not in here, because it's not per se surgeon, but it's, or not technical in any event, but it's working as a team, because the days of the surgeon saying, 
you're getting this operation, then I'm sending the oncologist, it shouldn't exist anymore. Rectal cancer care is very complex and it's multidisciplinary. And that's the other reason for the program. It's a team approach of working together with the pathologist, the imager, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and surgeon. And there may be instances where after the consensus and the patient gets uh, all upfront chemotherapy and then chemo radiotherapy, that there's a complete response and that there's no tumor left behind, not endoscopically, not on any imaging studies. And you elect to go wait and watch rather than doing an abdominal parental excision, and that's the no resection. So the debate used to be what type of resection, when relative to the end of chemo radiotherapy does the patient get the resection, but it's now do, do they get a resection at all? Clearly that's not a surgeon alone decision. So all of these decisions are, are made now as a group, and that's the crux of the program you'll hear about. So thinking about what used to be the case not that long ago, was what we call the five centimeter rule. And what the five centimeter rule was in any of the books published up until mm, even the late 80s, uh, if, the, if the tumor was within uh, five centimeters of the dentate line, the patient lost their sphincters. So basically, a lot of surgeons used to say when I was a resident, if you could feel the tumor, the patient got an abdominal pelvic excision because you needed a five centimeter distal margin. Fortunately, that was challenged by a few people simultaneously. Norman Williams, who uh, subsequently was at the <coughs> Royal uh, London Hospital in Whitechapel and then was uh, the president of the Royal College of Surgeons. At this point, he was a young surgeon in Leeds and decided to look with the pathologist there, Phil Quirk, at how much distal spread there was. And in fact, it turned out that there were, it was very rare to have any distal spread at all, let alone five centimeters. And if the patient did have distal spread, the tumors were such bad actors that the patients were dying of distant disease. So taking out all the extra distal uh, margin didn't really seem to be of any benefit, and in fact was to a detriment. At the St. Mark's Hospital down on, at the time on City Road in London, uh, John Nichols was a senior author on this study and did something very similar, said, well, what if the margins are two to five instead, or even less than two, and it turned out, as you can see, the local occurrence rates didn't change at all in these patients. So this was, was challenged, fortunately. At the same time, and this again is in Leeds with Phil Quirk, people started to pay attention, Quirk was the first one, to the uh, what's called now circumferential resection margins, but at the time initially it was called lateral resection margins. And if the margins were clear, local recurrence was highly unlikely, 3%. But if the margins were involved, it was pretty much a guarantee. 85%. So the focus started to change from going further distal to going wider, realizing, as I said earlier, you've got the constraints of the bony pelvis uh, as a challenge in, in, uh, in patients. And th but this held true. So subsequently, there's another study looking at the five-year disease-free and overall survival rates, which are vastly different whether or not the circumferential resection margin is involved by tumors. So the focus, the emphasis was to get around the tumor, not necessarily strictly just past it. What's evolved over the years, thanks to Gina Brown at the Royal Marsden and, and Imperial College London, Gina's an imager, and, and when she was finishing her training, uh, Bill Heald from Basingstoke, Phil Quirk from Leeds got in touch with her and said, we need to figure out how we can tell whether or not the tumor is involved prior to surgery, so we can make some therapeutic decisions in advance and then correlate with prognosis later. So Gina started working and she did her, her thesis on it and she made her career on it on being able to image through MRI rectal cancers. Prior to this point, it was rectal ultrasound, which really isn't terribly good at, at the depth of invasion. But here you can see with the thin slices how she can produce images that then have exact correlation with the post-operative specimens. And this is the, is the key, is being able to determine up front which again emphasizes what I said earlier, that it's not about the surgeon, yes, the surgeon's obviously part of it, but it's the imager producing these quality images, sitting with us, sitting with the medical and radiation oncologist, deciding whether or not the patients prior to surgery should get neoadjuvant or maybe all up front neoadjuvant, chemotherapy, then chemoradiotherapy, then surgery, and then going back and seeing what the correlation is. So that becomes a learning experience, and I'll touch on that later. And you can see how, so, we know from Phil Quirk and Birkbeck and others about the CRMs that, that I showed you, but, but now we can predict them up front. So if you have MR-involved CRM versus MR-clear CRM, you see the same things. Look at the local recurrence rate, 20% versus 7%. 
huge difference, highly predictive. So it's mandatory to image patients with a high quality thin slice rectal cancer protocol MRI before a therapeutic decision is made. So you can decide how to proceed. Is that margin potentially threatened or not? Putting it all together, we come to what became known as total mesorectal excision. So I mentioned a few times already, Bill Heald in Basingstoke, England, uh, came up with the idea that, well, if you were to go even five centimeters using uh, what, what I mentioned is does no longer exists, thankfully, the five centimeter rule, and you came across straight here, you'd still leave behind tumor deposits in the distal bit of the mesorectum, whereas if you came even a centimeter, and one of his papers is called the close shave, and he shows that even doing just a little microscopically free margin is sufficient provided, and I wouldn't necessarily, by the way, for any general surgery residents, put that as a board's answer, that acceptable margin is microscopically free. For an oral exam, you can discuss that for sure. Written is probably not the right answer, but it's no longer five centimeters either. However, by going just here and then coming around, as long as the mesorectum was out, Heald's results were very laudable. And, and you have to remember that prior to that time, and again, it isn't ancient history, at least I hope it's not, the 80s and 90s, Local recurrence rates were largely double digits, a few exceptions like St. Mark's Hospital, but these are local recurrence rates. So basically one out of five, one out of six patients who operate on for rectal cancer were going to end up with a local recurrence. So two things happened right about the same time. Uh, this is the North Central Oncology Group study, and what they found was that adding chemotherapy to radiation therapy, local recurrence rates could drop from 25% in the U.S. to 13.5%. <clears throat> but at right around the same time, John McFarlane from University of British Columbia in Vancouver decided to go do a sabbatical with Heald and audit all of Bill's data. And in looking through the data, which at the time was around about 150 patients or so, he found a local recurrence rate of 5%. So you want 5% with surgery alone or 13.5% adding chemotherapy and radiation, it seemed that surgery was, was coming out as a winner here, and this sort of TME challenge, as I like to call it, showed that this is the way we really should go. But people needed to learn it, and just because one master surgeon in Basingstoke could confer these results on his patient, did it mean that everybody else could? So Bill went on a crusade around the world for the next 30 years teaching people how to do TME, and this is one of the earlier studies in Sweden where there, were, uh, there was local recurrence rate 19%, just like at Memorial Sloan Kettering at the time, just like at the Tokyo National Cancer Institute, and so on and so forth. And the surgeons who wanted to learn TME did, and when they were, their data were audited, their local recurrence had dropped to 6%, right about the same as Basingstoke. But the surgeons who already knew exactly how to do it and didn't need some carpetbag or Englishman telling them how to operate kept giving their patients a 1 in 5 local recurrence rate. So lesson to be learned, you know, all of us at any point in our career can always do better, and these surgeons indeed did, as did others around the world. So with time, we started to see local recurrence rates go from double digits to very low single digits in, in many cases. Again, Bill's data that John McFarlane audited, and, and then uh, Warren Anchor at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Tokyo National Cancer Institute, and New Zealand, Australia, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, all over the world, people were able to reproduce these same techniques. So when you look at the limited distal margin, the adequate circumferential resection margin, and the high ligation that I showed you earlier in the anatomy drawing, so you've got your NCCN minimum of 12 lymph nodes, you should produce a specimen that is intact and glistening without any defects with a high ligation of the pedicle and with the fat, although it's cut off in the photo, the fat extending beyond uh, the mucosa. What you should not have is something that looks like your dog uprooted it from the garden earlier in the morning um, with a big chunk missing and muscularis exposed because that means your patient is highly likely to get a local recurrence. So over time, Phil Quirk, working with Iris Nagtikal in the Netherlands and others, came up with a, a classification system of incomplete, near complete, and complete. Basically, you want to achieve complete, near complete, tends to be produced a lot because of patients um, having specimens brought out minimally invasive. So there tend to be like flaps and things, there's nothing missing, but it's just like torn back. And a lot of times it's pulling it through a small wound protector or transanally that you just get a little tear, but there's nothing missing. It's just 
irregularity. That's different than defects where there's exposed muscularis and the fat is missing, and that's what we want to achieve. So if you're doing a TME, a proper TME, do you need to, as Crook had suggested in his 1991 uh, group in uh, uh, the uh, National, uh, sorry, North Central Oncology Group, rather, in the North Central Oncology Group study, suggested that chemoradiotherapy was a good thing. So is it still a good thing if you're doing an appropriate TME? And the Dutch TME study, I think, uh, a answered that question quite well about 10 years after the Crook New England Journal publication. And this is short course, which is seldom done in this country compared to Europe, less, far less frequently, short course radiotherapy. But even with that, so TME alone, the local recurrence rate was, as you'd predict, single digits, 8%, but down to 2.4% with short course. So how do we take it out? Total mesorectal excision, when appropriate, chemoradiotherapy. But then there's variability beyond that, which is surgeon influence. And this is one of the other reasons for the program. It's to standardize what we're doing with evidence-based guidelines for best practice, which again are depicted in the two-volume series from the Commission on Cancer on the ATLAS uh, Operative Standards for Cancer Management. So it's been around a while, but it's kind of like the white elephant in, in the room. So 1998 study. 683 patients in five hospitals, five colorectal surgeons, over 52 surgeons. So first thing that was found was colorectal trained surgeons tended to operate on more distal tumors, but despite having more distal tumors, were far more likely to perform a restorative resection rather than an abdominal perineal excision with a colostomy. Now you say that's fine, I'd rather have a colostomy if I'm out of a higher local recurrence rate, but it was actually the opposite. So. The best outcome for patients for local recurrence, just around 10%, was a higher volume, and we could argue about numbers. There was a Twitter battle two days ago about what should be the minimum number per surgeon, and I don't think anybody really has the right answer. But in any event, for the purpose of this study, it was at least 21 resections performed during the study period by people trained in colorectal surgery, lowest recurrence rate. The worst recurrence rate was a low volume of resections by somebody who didn't receive additional training coin toss, 50-50 local recurrence, you know, I mean, it, again, it, it kind of inherently makes sense. Do you want to get on an airplane and the pilot says, yeah, I do this uh, twice a year, I fly, it's not a problem, just relax. And it's a 737 max, but, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know, well, several of my trips back out here are on those, I'm re-questioning which airline I fly, but in any event. Um, you, you know, you're not going to feel comfortable like that, right? But yet patients are seem agnostic to this, and, and when you look through reams of literature, you see that in virtually every single study, patients are equally distributed amongst high volume, medium volume, and low volume centers, high volume, medium volume, low volume surgeons, just for whatever the reason, referrals, convenience, who knows? But it turns out that by multivariate analysis, the surgeon as a variable is right up there with things like a perforated tumor and perineural and vascular invasion as to who does the surgery. This is a study Helen Dorrance did uh, in, in the UK for the Association of Coloproctology, Great Britain, Ireland, and three and a half times more likely to develop a local recurrence, at least in the UK, when people were not trained. Now, the UK doesn't have training the way we do, so it's a focus and an interest. And I will say, and even though I'm past president of the American Board of Colorectal Surgery, I don't think it's necessary to necessarily be, and Stan Goldberg would kill me, I don't think you have to be trained as a colorectal surgeon, but I think you have to make it a focus of your practice. So you could be a general surgeon, surgical oncologist, minimally invasive surgeon, whether you're using a robot or laparoscope or whatever, but it has to be a focus. It can't be an occasional pastime, something you do when you know the patient happens to show up. That's the difference. It's not necessarily the board certificate. And that's been proven around the world. It's not just those studies. Les Bouquet pointed it out in Australia. Uh, this is the state of Maryland. This is in the state of Maryland database. Paul Hermanek is a, a German study. Uh, this is a New York State database study. China, many, many places in the world have shown this, that higher volumes of surgery, and again, nowhere here does it say certified by American Board of Colorectal Surgery, but outcomes by surgeon volume. Lower morbidity, lower mortality, lower recurrence rate, so when it's a focus of the practice. So putting all that together, how do we do as a country the way we do practice with patients going to high volume, low volume, medium volume centers? When you look at rates of colostomy around the world, we're the highest. 
these are data from, from California. We're, we're the highest, 50%. So this, these, are, these are your data here from the state of California, uh, AHRQ, and the uh, California database, 50% rate of colostomies. Circumferential resection margins, which we know is, is a, a vital aspect, getting a, a negative margin. You look at France, Germany, Netherlands, Poland, UK, all lower than the US, 17% circumferential resection margin positivity. Can these type of numbers be improved upon? Absolutely. In Sweden, and it's a very different system, obviously. It's a small country, small population, single payer, local recurrence rates by centralization of services to higher volume centers, local recurrence decreased 47% to 13%, survival increased. Another Swedish study looking at improvements in five and 10 year overall survivals after having centralization of services. Denmark. Similarly, improved survival. And what's interesting here in Denmark is it keeps improving. It just keeps getting better over time, even after the establishment of centers of excellence, as, as they're called in Denmark. And in the U.S., meanwhile, here's a study Rocco Riccardi did when he was at the University of Minnesota, 60% rate of colostomy across the country. It's double what was being done in Europe in the same time period. Most radical resections for rectal cancer resulted in a colostomy. And, you know, is it possible that rectal cancers in the U.S. all impinge on the sphincters and invade the dentate line compared to Europe? Probably not, and there's probably another reason there. And in another Rocco Riccardi study that he did after he went to the Leahy Clinic, he looked by county. So 21 states, county-level data on 20,000 proctectomies, 50%, which is where the number came in the other slide, also 50%. So but you can look by county and you can see where you stand. And, and it's unbelievable that in the U.S., colostomy rates 61 to 80 percent, 22 percent of counties, 81 to 100 percent, and so on. So this is a blow up of what I showed you in the other slide from the uh, California Office of Statewide Health uh, and Planning Development. Who performs proctectomies very much influences those data. So uh, this study shows 2,500 uh, surgeons, 2,600 surgeons, 7,500 proctectomies. So 40% of surgeons do only APRs. Again, I pose the same question. Do you think that that 40% of surgeons only see patients with tumors invading the anal sphincters? Probably not. You say anything's possible, but probably not. More so, probably not, because pa patients who are more likely to undergo restorative procedures had those procedures done at the hands of people who were doing more pelvic pouches and anorectal, i.e. focusing on colorectal. Again, it's not necessarily board certified. I really don't think that's the issue. The issue is making that the focus of your practice regardless of your training and, of course, as you'll hear about momentarily, working as a team. There were some other associations found that uh, these high stoma rate counties were less likely to have MR or PET scanners. And again, this isn't 1980s, it's 2010. Less likely to have MR scanners, PET scanners, less likely to have teaching hospitals, and less likely to have specialty surgeons. So taking all of those data together, seeing how technique is important, seeing how results can improve by working in centers where rectal cancer is a focus, when I was president-elect of ASCRS, got together with a group of people and said, let's try to bring a program like this to the U.S. and reached out to a variety of societies, College of American Pathologists, again, this is interdisciplinary, College of American Pathologists, American College of Radiology, Society for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract, American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, Society of Surgical Oncology and, and, and SAGES, and got people together from a variety of hospital systems and geographies to try to bring to light the issues and to try to come up with a proposal that would be acceptable to the Commission on Cancer and the American College of Surgeons Board of Regents and Officers to fund the program through the Commission on Cancer, say this is something we need to improve quality in the U.S. And over the next uh, number of years, since 2011, we put a lot of literature together showing what the problem was, the importance of multidisciplinary management, failure of evidence-based guidelines in the United States, that people weren't adhering to guidelines that already existed. This one I think we presented at American Surgical. Uh, looking at current evidence in the U.S., finding how accreditation made a difference in other centers, the importance, again, of multidisciplinary parapreve management, 
This is the paper in which we found the 17% local recurrence rate and so on and so forth. And we put a lot out there. And the reason that the group went to the COC and the ACS is because the ACS is known for quality programs. That is the mantra of the ACS is quality. And when you look at where that tradition started, the college was founded in 1913. By 1917, the college already had its first quality program, which was the Joint Commission. It's no longer a college program, but all the rest of the, of the programs are. The Commission on Cancer is almost 100 years old, and all the other programs listed here and others. So the ACS was the obvious place to go for quality programs. And within the ACS, the appropriate uh, location is the Commission on Cancer. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Commission on Cancer is not a surgical organization, despite the fact that it's housed within the American College of Surgeons as a quality program within the Division of Cancer that Heidi Nelson is now our director after Dave Winchester did it for 31 years. Uh, but it's everybody. Our, the current chair of the Commission on Cancer is Larry Shulman, medical oncologist from the University of Pennsylvania. So the groups who belong to this are not just surgical groups, medical groups, geneticists, tumor registrars, uh, lay groups, there are uh, Lance Armstrong and Susan B. Cummins and all the others. We, we just uh, brought on the, uh, the endocrine surgeons, just, just came in with a, a seat. So it's a lot of different people with the Commission on Cancer with a common goal. One of the main projects that Dave Winchester started, which is shared between the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer and the American Cancer Society, the National Cancer Database. National Cancer Database is the largest repository of cancer cases in the world. There are now something well over 40 million cases there, and these, each case has 250 data points. So I know Arden can probably do that math in her head, but I can't. But there's a lot of different permutations of things that you can look at with the NCDB, and that's why when you're a COC accredited institution, of which there are about 1,500 in the country, you have access to this data. You can see how you do uh, with your patients and put data into it. Does it matter in outcome to be accredited with a program like this? Uh, this is an interesting uh, paper that uh, was uh, put out two years ago in JAX. And what they looked at is one of the quality metrics. So the way these standards manuals work, for those of you not familiar, there's process standards, which are who you need in place, what things you need. And then there's performance standards, performance metrics, what you need to actually do. And then there's a whole host of things that are just captured for potential later use. So in the National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers, one of the standards is that post-mastectomy patients with four more positive lymph nodes should receive uh, post-mastectomy radiotherapy. So this study uh, was to look at how NABPC accreditation affected compliance with the quality uh, metric. So firstly, here's the COC hospitals. Now, NABPC is a bit different than NAPRC because it, NABPC accreditation doesn't require COC accreditation, so it's independent, although many hospitals have both. But the NABP centers, NABPC centers, did better at every time point than the COC centers. So when they started getting ready for accreditation, they did even better, but they still outperformed. So having this additional specialty accreditation was helpful, and it kept being helpful. As I showed you for the data from Sweden, once they started having centers of excellence, they got better when they started preparing for centers of excellence, but they kept getting better at every time point. And the same thing happened here. The NABPC centers had, a, had greater adherence to the standard than did uh, COC alone. And clearly, we have problems with adherence to guidelines here. This is one of our articles that the working group put together from the NCDB with 31,000 patients with rectal cancer. Here we found that the vast majority of patients were treated in low and intermediate volume centers, only 6,500 patients in high volume centers. Yet, the highest adherence to evidence-based guidelines was in high volume centers, so that the vast majority of patients in the U.S. were going to places where they would not necessarily have their care be along the lines of evidence-based guidelines. And here again, this is one I alluded to earlier, our 17% CRM positivity with tremendous variation across the country as well. So in 2014, I presented the work we'd done for three years to the Commission on Cancer and then to the Board of Regents, and there was approval to move forward with the program. So from 2014 to 2017, we spent three years putting together a standards manual as exists for 
the overall Commission on Cancer or for the NAVPC or for trauma and all the like, but relative to cancer for those other programs. And so we have our program management, our process standards, then our performance standards for clinical services, and then quality improvement metrics. So let me go through a couple of the salient ones. Number one, unlike NABPC, the hospital must be COC accredited. So of those 1,500 hospitals, about 250 or 60 said they would be interested in NAPRC accreditation. Uh, to date, there are six accredited centers, but the accreditation just came online within the last 12 months. There are 39 programs who are approved for site visits, so that'll get us up, assuming everyone's accredited, to 45 centers, about a fifth of, of the programs who we think will apply for accreditation. Um, this is the crux of it. It has to be multidisciplinary care of rectal cancer. It is not just, yeah, I, you know, thump my chest to do a great operation. It's not that. It's that I work with a team, and sometimes the team tells me, no, you're not operating at all, because this patient is getting neoadjuvant, and then maybe wait and watch, or worse yet, you know, you look at your TME specimen, and, and the group is telling you, you did that? Really? That's awful. So, I mean, this is a team effort. The, these folks, pathologists, radiologists, oncologists, radiation oncologists, can all go to 50% of the meetings, and they can have an alternate, which means everybody needs to attend 25%. But us as surgeons, we, need, we are supposed to go to every single meeting, particularly every meeting in which our own patients are uh, presented. There are educational modules. Now, when these things came online in the, in the uh, UK, they had workshops, but the UK is very different with the NHS. The surgeons would take a train somewhere and spend with their pathologists and radiologists, spend roughly three days doing workshops. Not practical for financial and geographic considerations in the US. So instead, what we have are educational modules. So Connor Delaney, who's the ASCRS uh, secretary, uh, was the one in charge of the project of getting an educational module for TME, which is almost live. It, it, it was uh, done with the assistance of Criterion, who helped us at SAGES with the FES project uh, and uh, FUSE and some of the other SAGES projects. College of American Pathologists, Marianne Obero, who's our head of pathology and lab medicine in Florida, was the CAP representative, and they have a really nice educational uh, manual at the CAP website for pathologists, but then there are supplemental material on the COC website. You can look at a specimen, decide what it is, look at bread loafing. And, and really, I think the best of all is the ACR. They really embraced it, and they have something that is Steven Spielberg quality for their radiologists that is multimodality, sounds, bells, whistles, beautiful how to perform these MRIs, how to interpret these MRIs. So everybody, every named member of the MDT has to pass his or her educational, has to take, not pass, has to take his or her educational module in these areas. Now, where is medical oncology and where is radiation oncology? One of the reasons we think the program succeeded is because we didn't try to dictate what they're doing in those other fields. We're looking at the perioperative management. Now, at some later date, might it spread out? Sure, but for now, this is where we are. So staging is key. I showed you some of Gina Brown's MRIs earlier, and we need to get a high-quality MR looking at these various components and looking at it on the big screen in conference like this at our MDT. Gina Brown started using synoptic reports for rectal cancer. We know that synoptic reports are helpful. You can see here that in the study done in, uh, with Gina's help, but from the Toronto group, easy to use, included appropriate items, and very importantly, improved data collection. So instead of fields being left blank because somebody interrupted or walked in the room while you're dictating or typing on, on screen, you can't close the report without everything being in it. What's good for the goose should be good for the gander, so we know that synoptic MRI reports are, are required, and we know that they help. What about op operative reports? So um, we obviously turn to uh, somebody expert in this, to Arden Morris, to help with, uh, with this part of the project, knowing how it has worked elsewhere. And again, another Canadian study looking at operative uh, reports in synoptic format from going from 46% of information recorded to 99% using a synoptic report. And I was part of a working group. I, I promise you I don't do either of these operations, but uh, by virtue of being the, uh, uh, the uh, Division of Research and Optimal Patient Care at the college as, uh, as a regent there. I was working with this, this group on putting the study together. And again, easy to use, 
uh, better and more accurate than a uh, standard operative report, far more accurate, better quality, and also good for data collection like NCDB. So as I mentioned, Arden helped put this together and it's been beta tested and she's putting together several manuscripts from it. If you want me to have a different picture for future talks, I'm open to changing some. But uh, I can tell you this, this is a key part of what we do because our pathologists do it, our radiologists do it, why shouldn't we do it? It's going to improve our accuracy, it's going to improve our data collection, and it's going to homogenize what's in the NCDB. And these are important things that we want to know and it's really easy to use. It's all pop-ups, takes just a couple of minutes, and you can then supplement it with narrative dictation as you like. The pathology synoptic reports have to be completed within two weeks using the CAP format. Also, similar to MRI, similar to surgery, free text reports capture anywhere in the things we're talking about, like intactness of mesorectum and the uh, status of the CRM, going from 76% to 100%. And this is exactly the information that we want for our patients. Specimen photography, this is a tremendous learning experience because we sit in our MDTs and we look at the specimen on screen not only the whole mount specimens, but then the bread loaf. So you can say, okay, here's the tumor and where is it extending to, and you can then correlate that, A, with how you did as a surgeon, B, how the imager do, particularly if the patient did not get neoadjuvant, or if they did get neoadjuvant and the patient was re-imaged after neoadjuvant, where do we stand? Here's an example. This one is a, a patient, we're told by our imager, that we've got tumor infiltration in the back of the prostate. So we did a TATME with an on-block prostatectomy. The urologist first said, they shouldn't, you know, really transanal? I said, well, you guys used to do it transperineal. You just go slightly posterior. It's the same thing. It'll work out fine. And we did a uh, transanal TATME with on-block prostatectomy, and lo and behold, there it is. So just like Gina Brown showed, it, these skills are translatable as long as you have an interest. Here's another example of EMVI, extramural vascular invasion of the tumor where you see it on the MR and there you see it on PATH and, and again it's an on-block resection. So we sit and look at these things. We make decisions based on what we see. So we have the pre-treatment conference and the post-treatment conference and all of those results are then communicated after both conferences to the referring physician, to, to the uh, GP, to the patient if the patient wants it as well. And then we have all of these quality measures that we know are important, but we don't quite know what to do with them just yet. Distal resection margin, the grade of the mesorectum, complete, near complete, incomplete. Rate of APRs, key, but key in relation to the height of the tumor, because it may be appropriate that you're the court of last resort here at Stanford and people come because two other surgeons told them you need an APR, and yeah, you in fact do need an APR. So the rate may be higher because they land here. So it's, it's relative to the height of the tumor. And all of these other things, including wait and watch. So all these data are being captured within the program so we can subsequently continue to revise the process and performance standards. There's no point in having a standard unless adherence to it improves outcomes. And, and now with Heidi on board, one of the things that we're doing as we work together with the AJCC, the NCDB, and a PRC and a BPC is trying to work together to standardize the data we're capturing to make sure the standards of the program, when adhered to, improve outcomes, which we'll know from the NCDB. So we're a, it's a tar, it's a moving target because we want them all to be relevant. Does it matter when you do this? Well, our Darcy at the Imperial put this one study out with, with Rob Glenn Jones, a medical oncologist, and they, and they looked together to see how many cases could be discussed, what kind of data came out. And the case history, which we do as a template by our residents, and the radiology and the pathology were the highest information. And surgery doesn't really factor into it because we're not saying anything other than what operation we did. And in the U.S., uh, uh, when uh, Jim Fleshman moved down from, from Wash U St. Louis to, to Baylor, they did a similar study. So Jim decided to look at prior to MDT, first year of MDT, second year of MDT, some of these things like persistent distal tumor, uh, local recurrence rates and found that the MDT improved outcomes even in a pretty short time once they started doing it. This study is out of uh, Cleveland Clinic main campus and what then is, is an interesting study and it goes back to what I said earlier about the surgeon needing to be humble and accept changes from the wisdom of the crowd. So uh, Matt Kaladi and the group looked at 408 rectal cancers, they had 371 responses. 
to this to see you as a surgeon had an idea in your head of what you're gonna do before you walk in that room. How often did it change? Now, of course, people have to be honest about it, but people were honest. And in fact, whether you were a junior surgeon, less than 10 years, a mid-level surgeon, 10 to 20, or more than 20 years out, you're just as likely to change your mind based upon the discussion that went on in that room, 23, 28, and 26%, which I think tremendously highlights the value of the MDT to discuss cases, not just to come in and say, this is what I'm doing, but let's talk about it based on the image, based on NCCN guidelines, based on presentations people have heard, the individual patient and the like, supporting the NAPRC, and, and Ohio is one of the six initial centers that's, that's accredited. Now, are we adhering to these things? So this is a, a study we put out, which was a voluntary questionnaire from 328 institutions who joined what the predecessor, the precursor group to the NAPRC was the Ostrich, the Consortium for Optimizing uh, Surgical Therapy for Echo Cancer, 42% response rate. The mean compliance with the 20 standards was half. So compliance with half of standards, 100% compliance was only in four centers. So plenty of room for improvement. And as I've emphasized multiple times during the talk, volume had a relationship with compliance and with improvement. So that's a, a questionnaire. The other way to look at it is reality. So the, using the National Cancer Database, not what you say you did, but what you actually did, and here, using this three-year period, we look to see the NAPRC process measures and performance measures. And the important performance measures, again, the circumference for a section margin, NCCN guideline for nodes. And what we found here was all process measures adhered to in only 28% of cases, which isn't all too different than, than you know, the, the ostrich study that we did, and what these numbers are is, is what the standard requires. So patients be clinically staged 95%, there's always gonna be somebody who they can't get an MRI because they've got a hip in place, whatever the case is, CEA treatment guidelines, tumor regression grading, we used VORAC, but whatever system you use. And then looking at the uh, performance measures, just over half had adherence in all cases for the important things, like that the status of the circumferential resection margin, and the like. So the, what we found being done in reality is pretty similar to what people said they were doing, which of course is reassuring. So what we've landed on now in, in, in 2019 is, is the National Accreditation Program for Echo Cancer. We have four committees, Executive Committee, Education Committee, Quality Committee, Standards Committee to parallel the NABPC and, and the COC overall. We're trying to keep things homogeneous at the college and in the cancer program, so it's more user-friendly. And in fact, we'd like the site surveys ultimately to be one visit so that the surveyor can look at you for COC and for NABPC, NABRC, and other things down the road. Representation for these committees, we sent out letters to, uh, not the ACS, but to the American Society of Colonial Surgeons, left an S off, American Society of Colonial Surgeons, Commission on Cancer, uh, sages and so on, asking for a, a nominee and an alternate for each of those four groups, for, for the four committees we have. And I think the due date was this Friday, March 15th. So as we get the names back, we'll start to populate the committees and, and move forward with our work. So the program has gone from something that uh, we hoped would happen to something that would happen. And we're very pleased that you know, we got site visited uh, and accredited before we had the structure before as chair, just when this was sort of more of an amorphous mass, uh, because we, we are very confident that with this program now in place, we're going to be able to improve quality care for patients with rectal cancer using the MDT approach, as has been shown successful in, in multiple European countries. And as we know from our review of the literature, is something which we direly need here in the U.S. So happy to answer any questions. Thanks.